country. Okay, great. Thanks. Who wrote the title to my talk, actually? Okay. Fair enough. It's a little more ambitious than what I'll actually do, which will hopefully be an introduction to the to the next three talks. So, uh, I did something similar last semester when it was more computer scientists, and there the people knew what tensor networks were, but not what critical exponents were. So, in this talk, I'll somewhat reverse the the priority of what I'll start at the very beginning from. Okay. So, since I'm going to be drawing lots of tensors and tensor networks, let me just to find the usual notation. Uh, and that's this Penrose notation for how to contract things together. So let's say I had a rank two tensor, which is just a matrix with two indices here. This is always going to be represented by a dot. That's the tensor. And it's going to have two legs for its two indices. So if I want to do a higher rank tensor, this of course generalizes. Okay. And What's most convenient is I'm going to represent Einstein's summation. So for instance, if I want to do matrix multiplication, just draw this as I, J, K. And what this means is if there's a leg connecting two tensors, it's implicitly summed over. So this is going to save a lot of space. OK, so arguably, tensor networks actually go back way before even what Joel said, which is just thinking about statistical integrals or even path integrals. So let's consider one-dimensional stat mix. So for instance, the icing model. The sort of thing I want to compute is a partition function. I have degrees of freedom on sites, which might be like a, a Boltzmann spin here, up or down. and. function is a, a sum over interactions here. So this is a simple example of a tensor network. So the way I can see this is by looking at the transfer matrix. So I take one element here, sigma i, sigma j, and this tensor, t sigma i, sigma j, is just one component of this Boltzmann weight. Okay. So this would just be some two by two matrix. So doing this summation over all the configurations of the spins is just equivalent to multiplying these matrices together. T, these are sigmas. So tensor networks are just a generalization of this to higher dimensionalities. So for instance, if I want to do a, a two-dimensional icing model, H2D, they're now going to be arranged into a two-dimensional grid, where now the indices to be summed over live on this two-dimensional grid of links. And these tensors would be the weights, the Boltzmann weights of the 2D icing model. So thinking about tensor networks as an entirely new object in physics is a little bit amusing, because really it's just a discretization of any path integral or Boltzmann sum. OK, so the reason this relates to states is the following. Let me, rather than considering just a partition function, I consider a, a generating functional. So for instance, we know if I want to know the generating functional for the correlation functions of magnetization, I add this auxiliary field here, h, and then generalize my sum. To also consider this external field here. So now I get a weight which depends on the external field H. So now the tensors that form the tensor network actually have three indices. There is the sigma, which are the icing weights. But then in each tensor, there's also the H. So this is e to the negative beta sigma i, sigma i plus 1, minus beta h i sigma i. So I have a rank 3 tensor. And this partition function, the generating function, now takes a structure like this. So I have two types of indices here. There's these indices, which are summed over. So people call those the virtual indices. Then there's the indices left here, 
which are left dangling. So these are the H's. So this would be the tensor network for a, a generating function. So to sort of change history a bit, the idea is rather than thinking of this as a generating functional for a 1 plus 0 dimensional StatMech model, I can actually think of this as a wave function for a quantum ground state. So for instance, suppose I have a spin system like an icing model, which is now a quantum spin system. So my wave function is going to describe a configuration on some one-dimensional lattice of spins. And the most general form it can take is going to be some quantum mechanical amplitudes. So this is a, a large vector. It's in a 2 to the L dimensional vector space. If you draw it as something like this. This is psi. And the idea is I'm going to consider an onsatz for this, for this wave function, which is the following tensor contraction. Now the key thing that Joel alluded to is what's special about ground states is that they're ground states of local Hamiltonians. So these amplitudes have a very special structure. And what considering onsets which come from uh, contracting these tensors together is precisely it captures the locality of entanglement in these systems. So this particular onsets is called a matrix product state. And it can be proven to work if we generalize this in two ways. So first, we need to let the sum sigma not just run over, say, up and down. But in general, the sigma on each link is going to be in some high dimensional vector space. Two, we need to let these, these weights, h sigma sigma, rather than thinking of them as being from some simple Boltzmann model, they're just going to be arbitrary tensors that we're going to treat variationally. So these two conditions together define the matrix product state variational class. And what Hastings showed was that for all gapped ground states in one dimension, they obey both an area law and they have a matrix product state form. So basically, gap states. So th this has been the basis for DMRG is basically a, a variational method for your given Hamiltonian. How could I optimize the tensors of these onsets to uh, best approximate the ground state? And basically, there's proofs now that these algorithms must always work. So in some sense, Massive field theories in one dimension can all be solved numerically using this. So just to be clear, the chi is held fixed as you take the, the size of the length of the infinity? Yeah, exactly. So what makes this efficient is that chi doesn't grow with the size of the system if it obeys an area law, so if, if there's a gap. So to generalize this to two dimensions, it's the naive and the same generalization we made from going from a 1D Boltzmann sum to a 2D one. Now I have a 2D array of tensors. And my quantum system now lives on this 2D array. So now I have a dangling, a dangling index for each, each site. So this would be my. <coughs> so this on slots is called PEPS. Um, it's rather interesting. A lot less is known about these 2D states. So in, in 1D, we can prove both exactly what states they represent, gap ground states. And you can prove that, say, measuring any observable can be done efficiently. In 2D, we both don't know what states take this form. We're not sure that all gap states do. And even if you had the wave function in this form, we don't, in general, know how to efficiently compute, say, a, a one or two point function. Um, so a lot of work that's going on right now is to figure out, in 2D, can we actually use this as a basis for efficient numerical algorithms or not? OK, so now I want to understand the entanglement properties of these tensor networks. So what's special about entanglement in them? Sorry. Yeah. And what about, can a quantum computer, uh, under certain circumstances, uh, compute this? Um, so could it, say, contract? Yeah. No. I don't think so. What? Is that a matter of 
covered. No, no, but they're like so the what, construction uh, stuff. Well, I'm just saying, well, so are there any known restrictions under which it can <coughs> and get an added contract? What's the condition? You can get an additive approximation for tensor network compression using quantum computer. Additives uh, and the scale of this additive approximation will be the, the norm of this. The product of the norms of the tensor in the order in which you program. I don't know if it's known, though, what precisely the class would be in which it could be efficiently done, if you make restrictions on the tensors. Since this is a pep, why can't I just synchronize as preparing each state and then do a measurement on each single state? Because you do a projection and you need post selection. I mean, you, you cannot be sure that you go to the right one. If the tensors are all unitary, is that not an issue? You could just think of it directly as a quantum computation. Well, yeah, let's see, what, what do you mean, in what direction are you thinking of it as being unitary? In, in any direction. But, but in here. Yeah. But in these exactly networks, they're yeah, yeah. unitary. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, if you knew that looking at it this way, it was all isometries, then it could be efficiently done. But you can prove basically no states can actually be put in that form. With some assumption about what kind of states you're talking about? Um, well, so for instance, if, it, if each of these tensors is an isometry uh, in some direction like this, Meaning that contracting these three legs is an isometry with respect to, to these two. Uh, you could prove, for instance, that the entanglement spectrum in such a state is completely flat. So it's not actually a generic ansatz. Um, well, in this particular case, if I made some bipartition like this, all the Schmidt values would, would be the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's also an open question. So in 1D, we know, for instance, there's a certain canonical form you can put the tensors in, like that they are isometries in a certain direction. It's not really known in 2D. There's a lot of gauge redundancy here, because you can uh, insert various resolutions of the identity, not just on bonds, but on string-like surfaces. And it's not really known how much you can fix that redundancy. <coughs> OK, so let's calculate the entanglement of a region in this sort of ansatz. So this is a simple picture we need. If, if psi is a wave function in some tensor product Hilbert space, let's suppose as an ansatz that it takes the form of just, say, a two-site matrix product state. So I have indices I left, which runs over the full Hilbert space on the left, same on the right, and then some bond summed over here. And I'll assume, as before, that this runs over chi possible values. So it's simple to see that if I want to look at the reduced density matrix for the left part of the system, <coughs> the special thing about this ansatz is that the rank <coughs> the left is strictly less than or equal to chi. That's just because the number of, sh uh, for instance, the number of singular values you could possibly have in this matrix here is bounded by, by chi. So that one thing that follows from this is if you look at the von Neumann entropy or entanglement entropy for region on the left, uh, it's also less than or equal to, to log of chi. So you can put an upper bound, but generically this won't actually be saturated, which we'll return to. OK, so let's, let's evaluate this for a PEPS. Suppose the subregion I want to consider might be this block of six spins here. So let's call this region X. It has six sites in it, and the rest of the system is, is X bar. So we see that because of the form of the tensor network, it's actually just a thickened version of this sort of wave function here. So I want to con if I could if I just contract these six tensors together, I get onsets of the following form. There's a, a big box here that has six legs coming out. This is I in region X. Then I have some number of bonds exiting through the boundary, 
these are the sigmas. And then this is a gigantic tensor, which actually has an infinite number of bonds here for So the tensor network for any two, by partition always takes this form. So to bound the rank of the reduced density matrix for x, I can just apply this formula here. So let's say that each of these sigmas, let's label these bonds by k. So this here is a collection of indices sigma k. For the peps, we're going to have that the rank of rho x is less than or equal to the product over all the bonds which cross the boundary of the dimension of the bond there. Let's say this is chi k. So that's the dimension of the bond. And it follows from this that the entanglement in region x is less than or equal to the sum of the boundary bonds. So for any region x, these k's run over the boundary of the region. So um, the amount of entanglement in a region is bounded by the area of the perimeter rather than the volume of it. So this is the area law. So it's certainly only going to capture states which obey that. So this is a very, very crude bound that's less than or equal to. Uh, and I think one of the key problems is understanding how do I make this, uh, this bound tighter? What actually is the entanglement um, in terms of the tensors? So let me say one sufficient condition, which I think will be talked about later in the day, in which this bound is actually saturated. So it reduces a simple property of this particular map here. So sometimes this is called the bulk boundary map. So when I had this region that I picked out, there was two types of indices. There's the indices on the virtual boundary, and then there were the physical indices by the bulk. So I can think of this as a big box, X, sigma. Uh, sometimes this is called A, the bulk boundary tensor. And I, if I think of sigma as the input and Ix as the output, A is a map from boundary spins into the Hilbert space of the subregion X. So a sufficient condition for the tensor network to actually saturate this bound is if A is an isometry. So you can show that if AA dagger is 1, then the bound is saturated. So another way to put this in English is if for each value of the boundary spins, I get a distinct orthogonal state for the bulk, then the onsot saturates this entropy bound. So if we want to understand uh, what the corrections are, the more precise way of putting it, it's ultimately going to amount to understanding what the properties of this tensor are for, for more generic, generic onsets. Are there physical states where you'd expect that bound to be saturated? Or is it uh, well, one could argue if you just take large random tensors. But I, so I come from more of a physics background. I mean, are there systems whose ground state is naturally large random tensors, is maybe the way to put it? Um, well, I think, I mean, this is Brian's idea that, well, let's see, in 2D. OK, well, one example actually is the toric code actually saturates this bound, except mod, mod the topological entanglement entropy. Um, so I think most fixed point wave functions, things with zero correlation length, modulo possible topological correction are of this form. OK, so now let's consider a state which can't be put in this form. So we said uh, the wave functions have to obey the area law. So we know one situation in which the area law is actually uh, violated is for 1D critical systems. So for a 1D critical system, we know that if I take a 1D chain, cut it as x and x bar, this has length Lx. <coughs> Entanglement is going to go like zero three. Or C is the central charge. So what this tells you is if you tried to find a matrix product state representation of it, 
the dimension that you need to use would actually diverge with uh, the length of the system you tried to approximate. So the question is, how, how can we fix the onsets in order to be actually uh, accommodate a log L violation of the area law? So let me do something that won't work first, um, because it starts giving us intuition for how the geometry of the tensor network leads to sort of geometric in, uh, interpretation of the entanglement. So let me first fix it in 1D by starting with a matrix product state and then just trying to add hidden nodes, so to speak. So I'm going to add more layers up here like this. So my spins only live at the boundary here, but I'm going to add a larger bulk here which gets integrated over or summed over. So now what I want to understand is if I take onsets like this, uh, what's the maximum entanglement I can have in some particular subregion? Okay, so suppose, for instance, I consider x to be these two spins here. So what's entangling these two spins with the rest of the system like that. So I know for, for this particular cut, the amount of entanglement is going to be bonded by the, uh, bounded by the bond dimensions of these four lines. If I make it larger, the way to cut it would be like this. But the interesting thing in this network is that if I look at a region which is too large, this is not really the correct way to do it. What you actually want to do is go up, and then all of this is for free, and then I can come back down. Because here I'm going to only cut six nodes, whereas if I kept going through here, I'd cut a linear number of links. So if I define chi k to be the uh, dimension of the, each of these links, and I take a curve gamma to be a collection of the links, let me define the length of the curve to be the sum of k within gamma of log k. So what I can do to bound the entropy in a given region is find a gamma which cuts out that region of minimal length, where length is defined by this definition here. So for this network, if I were to To draw a graph of the bound I get, S is the S max as a function of the length of the region I pick out. <coughs> the initial steps, the shortest path, stays right near the edge, and then the length goes up linearly. But then as soon as I re reach what the depth of this was, it's now quicker to just leave the tensor network, and then it saturates. This maximum saturation here is related just to the depth of the tensor network. So this was the simple case where it would just be linear and saturate when all of these links had the same weight. You can imagine in a more general situation where the, the links had different weights. It's going to be an optimization problem. Uh, so let's say the chi k's were smaller here you're going to tend to want to leak into the, up into the network in some way in order to minimize the length of the curve according to this, this definition. Sorry, I don't understand. Um, each of these points in your graph correspond to a different region. Yes, so this, is this graph here. Yeah. yeah. So you're, I don't understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to minimize over all regions? or what OK, yeah, let me do this again. So. So suppose I want to consider a subregion of length L. For this onsets, I want to get the best bound I can on the amount of entanglement in that subregion. So let me fix the region L. What I can do is consider different curves which cut out these two sites. And you don't care if they include also other sites? Yeah, you'll get a weaker bound if they included other sites, just because the Entropy of one reduced density matrix is bounded by anyone that includes it. 
So fixing L. There's no state associated with the bulk size. So once you fix the boundary, the, set, the physical regime you talk about is fixed. Yeah, I mean, the sense in which you could include extra sites is even if I was only interested in these two, I could still make this curve in order to bound it. Um, I've added an extra site, so I won't get the best bound I could, but it would still be a bound. So what you want to do is find the curve with largest, with the smallest length, which just encloses, encloses the region in question. Yeah, and so the variational problem is if, if you assign this weight to any curve you cross, to any link you cross, to find the curve with minimal length according to this definition. So this is like the, the lattice interpretation of the Ryutaki and Agi formula. And the problem is it's very crude because this, this is purely an upper bound. Um, and what needs to be understood is what the property of the tensors are in order to make it more of an equality rather than just a bound. So here we've shown that so long as the network has some finite depth, once the region is large enough, it always pays to just leave, go out the top of the network. So there's always going to be some finite entanglement uh, for the region. So we can't, with that on sots, get a, a logarithmic violation. So the idea of Giffrey Vidal was to consider a hierarchical network that extends all the way out to infinity. Let me make one more bad guess. So we know we need to go out to infinity in, in the, the new direction. We also know that if it's a CFT, there should be some notion of scale invariance. So perhaps the correct thing to do is just a tree of tensors. So the problem with this onslaught is we see that if I pick a region like this, it's actually very cheap to bound this region. I can just take a curve that goes up and comes back down. And I mean, we can see there's going to be arbitrarily large regions which only will cross one, one cut. So this doesn't actually contain enough entanglement. So the simple way to fix it is I need to penalize moving up through the network. I have to make sure there's new bonds I'm going to be crossing. So the way to do that is to add links like this. So now the length of this curve, let's say all these had the same bond dimension, will depend on how far I go up. And that's going to cause it to curve back down. So in the simplest case where I assign equal weight to all of them, um, the, the number of bonds I'm going to cross is going to be logarithmic in the distance here because uh, as I go up, I'll cross about log L bonds as I go up and come back down. So in this case, for a, a length of the curve gamma, including a region of length L, will go as log L. Now, of course, in this bound, it doesn't tell you anything about the possible coefficient because we don't really know the proper way to, to weight the. We don't really have a um, way to assign the correct prefactor there. OK, so this is the sort of connectivity which would give you logarithmic entanglement. Um, but it turns out if we just use completely arbitrary tensors here, it's impossible to do anything useful with the network, say, if you want to put it on a computer and actually compute properties of the wave function. So what Giffrey Vidal proposed was that you can actually make a vast simplification to everything if these tensors have simple properties, in particular, a certain notion of unitarity. So the resulting onsatz is called the multi-scale entanglement renormalization onsatz. So the structure of the network is like this. There's two types of tensors. 
so this is um, the sort of simplification of this case. There's actually less vertical links. I'm sorry, less horizontal links. But still, because there's these links that go like this, as you go up through the network, unlike the tree case, you do cross bonds, so you still get the log violation of entanglement. And what he said was that these tensors had to take a particular form. So there's these two to one tensors, which are thought of as coarse graining. And then these are two to two tensors, which are the disentanglers. So the way coarse graining is defined, so these I'll call V, is that the property of this tensor is that it's an isometry in the following form. So if this is V, if I view this to be the row, and this to be the column, then V, V dagger needs to be the form. So it's basically a projection operator. And in particular, as long as you think of it as pushing states this way, it's norm preserving. So this is the isometry condition. So the second type of tensor are these two to two ones. U. And these are unitaries. U dagger. So this is called the disentangling step, and this is the coarse graining step. So let me explain why that that's going to simplify things. So the, the key point here is that because these are unitaries and isometries, there's essentially a, a sharp velocity of light in this network. When I add the onsets here, if I twiddle with something here, it can propagate arbitrarily far that way. So there's not really strict causality. Whereas in this case, because the network is sparser, a change here can at most flow like this. So let me say how that actually lets you compute something. So what Giffrey showed was that if you, Joel? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let me just say the, the interesting thing that Giffrey showed was that if you had the wave function in this form, and he provided a procedure to, to find it, giving the Hamiltonian, that it actually encodes all the data of the CFT due to this special structure. So what the idea is, is that this network should actually just be thought of as the dilation operator of the CFT, a lattice version of it. So if I look at the wave function here, it's going to have, say, L sites. After one layer of this network, because of the coarse graining, there's L over 2 sites. So this has L sites. This has L over 2. And we can think of this motion here as being, or I can do it this way, is a sort of renormalization step, R. This is just a quantum operator taking a Hilbert space on L sites to a Hilbert space on L over two sites. So what the idea is is that R, this operator, is the lattice version of the dilation operator in the C of T. So this would be e to the i log 2 d where there's the generator of scale transformations. And what one can show numerically, and I'll say how, is that this appears to actually be true. And we know that if you know the behavior of all the scaling transformations, you know the spectrum of all the uh, conformal weights in the theory. So the way we can test this is figure out how, if you take a local operator and conjugate it by R, how does that operator renormalize? So if I have some local operator, I, the way it transforms under a dilation is to shift it. And I also get 
a rescaling by the anomalous dimension I'll call delta phi. So if I exponentiate this. Sorry, can I? Yeah. What is r hat versus r? Um, these, these are the same. It's just the operator. That R, that's R is going to reduce the dimension. I mean, you're confused by something. R hat looks like it doesn't have a kernel, whereas R does, right? Um, I think the way I'll think of it is R goes from the, the input would be in the UV, and the output would be in the IR. So what do you mean by reduce the input? You're wondering which side is the larger Hilbert space? That, that, uh, that continuous expression looks reversible, and that one is not reversible. I mean, that's the, that's the well, you could just feed in this. I mean, this V, you can just think of it as a unitary where you feed in a zero, right? But, I mean, that's... Uh, and you're not reducing dimension, right? Yes, that's right. But implicitly, that's what, that's what you're really doing. Well, I, I think it's a little bit of a subtlety... So to understand whether you should think of this thing as being unitary or being an isometry depends on once we think about the lattice again. Um, so you could ask, suppose you have the Hilbert space of a ring of length L. Um, what the dilation operator does is it relates that Hilbert space to the Hilbert space of a ring of length L over 2. Now, if you don't consider there to be any cutoff, both of them are infinite dimensional Hilbert space, and you can actually think of the two as being unitarily related. When it isn't unitarily related is when you actually consider it as a lattice model where there's a cutoff. So I think it's fair to say in the continuum, you can think of this as being a unitary operation. But, but I guess I'm, not, I'm confused what L and L over 2 mean in that context. Well, OK, so L and L over 2 means suppose I temporarily consider it to be on a ring uh, rather than an infinite line. There's certainly been a decimation of half the sites, which is what I mean by L and L over 2. I can, I, I mean, concretely consider it to be on a ring. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, an interesting question there. A ADS CFT, the gravity way of thinking about it, really suggests that we should think of this as a re reduction in the number of degrees of freedom as we flow in. Mm -hmm. This alternative viewpoint, where you basically spit out lots of trivial spins as you as you move in and think of it as unitary evolution, is interesting as well. There's a recent paper by Takayanagi. Uh, suggesting that, you know, in, 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 at some level, those, the number of those trivial states keep track of how far in I am from the boundary. Okay. And, and I think if that viewpoint is correct, then there will be something wrong in the way that we've been thinking about this problem from the gravity viewpoint. It's very different from, from the RG viewpoint that we've had on this so far. Right. I mean, if I do want to think about this on a ring, say, in a 1 plus 1D CFT, we can say exactly what this operator does. So I, we know by the operator state correspondence, if I have a ring of circumference L, I can label all the states by some particular operator in the theory at L. And what this operation will do is, in a sense, just do nothing. It will just. directly relate the Hilbert space of a ring of circumference L to the one at L over 2. But there's just a one-to-one -one correspondence between the states because they're labeled by operators. And what's changed is when we know there's actually a physical cutoff, the very, very high weight states here aren't really physical because they're above the cutoff. Is a unitary or it's not? Um, well, it depends on the point of view. So if, if I do this on a finite ring, it will be an isometry rather than a unitary. But the, what's and this d hat is what kind of operator it is? Uh, d, d hat? Yeah. Well, so I mean, really, d hat's only going to be defined in the continuum where I can do this infinitesimally. Um, this would be when you're starting to describe a mirror, which is a finite dimensional uh, <coughs> transfer network, so, so how did we get to the continuum here? 
Um, well, okay, so I think I'm not actually going to do it in the continuum. I'm always going to go by log two steps. But uh, the intuition for what we should expect, I, I'm just motivating the in intuition for what we should expect for how R behaves. So, so sorry, yeah. Can we, can we stick to the finite dimensional picture and then say, could you say what these operators are there and then we can? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let me consider, yeah, so I think the way to be concrete is rather than talking about R itself, let's say what R does to a local operator under conjugation. So, because of this definition, let phi denote some like one point operator, some local operator localized near x. So I can ask what happens when I conjugate by, by, by r. OK, so by way of motivation, what would happen in the CFT is because of this commutation relation, I will get something like this. To the delta. Now the two here is just because I have coarse screened by a factor of two. Okay, so this is the expectation if we know something about CFT. I can just say what operationally it means given the disc discrete tensor network. So the equivalent of my O is some, let's say, two site gate localized in a region. So this is O, and elsewhere it acts as the identity. So what I want to do to implement this R is to conjugate by one layer of the mirror. So what that looks like is This is, again, a definition of an operator on a lattice with half as many sites. And the key simplifying property is the fact that these are isometries and these are unitaries. So what it, what it means, since this is R, and this is R dagger, far away, they cancel in pairs because of the condition u u dagger equals 1. So all these cancel. What I'm left with is some sort of impurity here in the identity far away. So what this map has done is it's taken uh, a tensor acting on a finite number of sites to a new operator, which acts on, in this case, three sites. So the mirror preserves locality in that when it conjugates a local operator, it turns into another local operator. And the way one would um, extract from this what the scaling operators are is to look precisely for eigenoperators of this transformation. So if you can find some three-site operator that under conjugation returns to itself, that's the scaling operator in the theory. So what Giffrey was able to show numerically was you can actually carry out that procedure. Given the u's and v's, he diagonalizes the operation of conjugation by r, uh, and the, uh, the full spectrum is actually the scaling uh, spectrum of the CFT. So that's why it would prove useful there. I know we've had a lot of good questions over long enough, but it might be good to get to a summary and then we can have more open questions. Okay, I, I think I can stop right there. Thanks. Okay.